from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to introduce Kathy Weinberg, who you know, who's our consultant for the Dean Board at the Library of Congress. And Kathy will introduce Monica Hess. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And I know this is a little different because we're not reading, reviewing, doing our small groups. I have a pretty loud voice, so I'm OK with that this time. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're, we still want you to read and review the advanced copies of the team books. And that's been great. So keep those reviews coming. But now, the most important part of today is Monica Hesse is author of The Girl in the Blue Coat. And she has also written two other uh, teen books. And she is also a writer for the Washington Post. So she has two different careers going on. She, I think she works 24-7 or something. 48-7. <laughs> anyway, I think you'll enjoy her book. It's historical fiction. It takes place during World War II. And it's got a girl who is kind of in a position of having to make a choice between just kind of turning the other, you know, just looking the other way or um, are helping some people that really need help, some Jews during World War II. So Monica, thank you very much for coming. Um, so I hear some of you are journalists. Yes? Raise your hand if you're in a journalism class. Excellent. Oh, this makes my job so much easier because I'm going to trust that when I run out of things to say, you guys will be much more interesting and have lots of questions to ask me. Yes, 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 that's true. And you in the back, you are not journalism students, but you are readers. Awesome, okay. Um, so I work for the Washington Post, and that's my day job. It's been a kind of crazy year. How many of you follow politics? Okay. It's been kind of a crazy year, right? Um, so I, I um, this year I got to do things like go to the political conventions in Philadelphia and Cleveland, and that was really interesting to see the, to see the country and, and what kinds of things people were talking about and how um, sometimes it seemed like people were not even talking in the same languages. Um, I also get to do other kinds of stuff, like I went to the Oscars. So um, I always tell people if we can't think of anything to talk about in the realm of historical fiction, we can talk about um, Jennifer Lopez's butt because I accidentally touched it when I was at the Academy Awards. And that is, that is an experience unto itself. Um, so, so when we have time for questions, I hope that journalists will ask me questions about journalism, which I love to talk about. It's the best job ever. And, um, but for now, we'll start off by talking about this book. This book. Um, how many of you read historical fiction on a regular basis? How many of you think it sounds like a really boring genre? You won't offend me? OK, yes. Um, so here's what I think is really interesting about history. It keeps repeating itself. And even when you think that you're writing about another time and you think that you're researching another time, you are actually researching right now. You are actually seeing patterns come out again and again. Um, I'm going to tell you what this book is about, and then I'm going to tell you what this book is really about. Um, so th this book is about a teenage girl who lives in Amsterdam in 1943 when it has become occupied by, uh, by the SS, by Nazis. So on every street corner she goes, there are uh, Nazi guards dressed in green. and. Um, there are curfews, and she's not allowed to go out, and, and people are disappearing all around her because Jewish families are being taken, um, and they're being deported into concentration camps. Um, and she makes her living as a black market worker. So in this age, it's impossible to get things like cigarettes and alcohol and chocolate and perfume and these sort of luxury goods. And so my character, Hanukkah, she makes her living by moving around the city getting these goods under the table and then selling them for a profit. And one day, one of her regular clients asks her for help finding something extra special, um, and it's a person. And her client says, I've been hiding this, Jewish, this young Jewish girl 
in my pantry for the past couple of months and she's disappeared into thin air. And so my character has to figure out how to go about searching for a girl who is not supposed to exist at all because she's Jewish and most of the Jews in the city have been deported. So that's what the book is about. It's a mystery about trying to find a missing person when you live in a police state, um, when the people around you are being, are being harmed, are being deported. What the book is really about is about trying to figure out how far you will go to do the right thing and how you know what the right thing is. And, and how do you forgive yourself when you've been doing the wrong thing for a long time? It's about um, betrayals between friends. And it's about losing the first person that you love on, in, a, in a permanent way. Um, raise your hand if you think like me. Whenever I would think about the Holocaust before writing this book, I would always think, well, I would have been one of the people who, who, who was a part of the resistance. Like, obviously, I would, have, I would have volunteered. Like, I would have helped hide people. Like, I would have been a part of that. Yes? I think it's, 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 like, it's so easy to think that. And here, here's what's fascinating. It was really hard to be a part of the resistance. It, you, would be, um, you would be imprisoned. You could be killed. Your family would definitely lose its livelihood. If you're, if you're a character like my character, Hanukkah, who supports her family, um, being part of the resistance would probably mean poverty and homelessness for your family. And so what I think is really fascinating is that it's so easy to say what we think we would do. And then when we're put to the test, like, would we really do that? And I think about that now when we talk about things like um, when we, when we talk about things like Syrian refugees, should we accept Syrian refugees into the country? Because they were having that discussion 80 years ago about whether we should accept Jewish refugees into the country. When we talk about, will we stand up and protect people of, of different faiths? Like, will we stand up for our Muslim brothers and sisters? They were having that conversation 80 years ago, but it was about the Jewish people who lived among them. Um, so I totally get that reading historical fiction can seem just like, so snoozeworthy and boring. But, um, but I feel like you're reading about people, like, no matter where people lived. And, and that's, what I, that's what I like about it. Um, for those of you who actually like historical fiction, do you have any recommendations? Did you raise your hand? What do you, what do you like? Yeah, or, or the genre, or the era, or the time? Oh, what's that about? Oh my gosh, that book sounds amazing. <laughs> Who else wants to read that book? I do. OK, does anyone else have any favorites before we get started? No? All right. Yes, you. The Boy in the Short Oh, that's really good. And that's also, that's also World War II. Yeah, that's a great book. Thank you for recommending that. Um, so here's what I thought that I would do. And you guys tell me if you have a different way you do this more than I do. You're here all the time. Tell me if I'm breaking any rules. I thought that I'd read you a couple of pages from my book so you have a kind of a better sense of who the characters are. And then I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I came up with those characters. If there are writers in this room, sometimes coming up with characters is really hard. So I wanted to pass around some historic photos that gave me kind of a context and background. Um, and then we'll do questions. And we can talk about whatever you want for questions. Does that sound? Yes, no, OK. Th I got more thumbs up than thumbs down. That's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to steal this book, because I forgot to bring my own. So it's lucky that one is sitting right here. So, um, so like I said, this book, um, it opens with this main character, Hanukkah, who uh, has just been asked by this client, Mrs. Janssen, to find this young girl who's gone missing. And so I'm going to read you just a couple pages from just after this request has been asked. Okay. 
Mrs. Janssen is still waiting for me to respond, standing in the dark space where the air is stale and it smells faintly of old potatoes. Hanukkah, she asks. You were hiding someone? I can barely get the words out as she relatches the secret shelf, closes the secret pantry door, and leads me back to the table. I don't know if I'm more shocked or more scared. I know this happens, that some of the Jews who disappear are packed like winter linens in other people's basements rather than relocated to work camps, but it's too dangerous a thing to ever admit out loud. Mrs. Janssen is nodding at my question. I was. But in here? You were hiding someone in here? For how long? Where should I begin, she says, picking up her napkin and twisting it between her hands. I don't really want her to begin at all. Ten minutes ago, I was worried that Mrs. Janssen might have called someone to arrest me, but now I know she was the one who could be arrested. The punishment for hiding people is imprisonment, a cold, damp cell where I've heard of people disappearing for months without even getting hearings. And the punishment for being a person in hiding is immediate deportation. Never mind, I say quickly. Never mind, I don't need to hear anything. I'll just go. Why don't you sit down again, she pleads. I've been waiting all morning for you. She holds up a pitcher of coffee. More? You can have as much as you like. Just sit. If you don't help me, I'll have to find someone else. And now I'm conflicted, standing here in the middle of the kitchen. If Mrs. Janssen tries to find someone else, she could be putting herself in danger, and me too. Tell me what happened, I say finally. My husband's business partner, she begins. He was a good man, David. He worked for Hendrick for 10 years. He had a wife and they had two daughters, Leah, who had just turned 12 and was the family pet, and the older daughter, 15, independent, always off with her friends, Miriam. Her throat catches at that last name and she swallows before continuing. The Rudvelts were Jewish, they not very observant, and in the beginning it seemed like that would make a difference. It didn't, of course. In July, after the big razzia, when so many Jews were taken, David came to Hendrick and said he and his family needed help going into hiding. And Hendrick brought them here, I ask. No, he didn't want to put me in danger, she says. He brought them to the furniture shop. He built the Rudvelts a secret room behind a false wall in the wooden shop. I didn't even know. You didn't know, I say. I can't imagine my own parents being able to keep such a secret from each other. I knew Hendrick was spending more time in the shop, but I thought he was just working longer hours. I, I thought the Rudvelts had gone to a safe house in the country. I didn't know all of them were right there in hiding. When did he finally tell you, I ask. He never told me. Last month I was home alone when I heard knocking at my door, frantic knocking, it was after curfew. I thought Hendrick had forgotten his key, but when I opened the door there was this girl, this pale girl wearing a blue coat. She'd grown so much, I hadn't seen her in a few years, and I wouldn't have recognized her if she hadn't introduced herself. She told me that my husband had been hiding them, but now she needed a new safe space. She said that everyone else was dead. Okay, so that's, that's sort of near the beginning of the book. And so here's what we know. We know that this girl appeared out of nowhere, and then she disappeared into nowhere. And we have to figure out where she went. And that, that is going to involve going all around the city of Amsterdam. Um, so I wanted to show you some pictures of Amsterdam because I'm kind of a nerd and I really like research and I really like these photos. Um, you know when I was talking about like trying to figure out what you would do in this situation, like would, would you be on the good side, would you, would you, would you not? Um, when I first started doing research for this book, this was the first photo that I came across. The photos are all messed up, I'm gonna find them. Okay, so this photo that I'm gonna pass around, um, you'll see it has, um, it has groups of people walking in the street. And some of them are walking on the sidewalk and some of them are walking in the middle. You, you, pass, you guys pass up, you guys pass back, we'll meet in the middle. Um, so what's happening is that this group of people in the middle, that's a group of Jewish people who are being walked to a deportation center. And when I say a deportation center, do you, do you guys know the Kennedy Center here in DC? Okay. So in Amsterdam there was a really famous theater called the Dutch Theater. And in 
during the time of World War II, that became the deportation center. So picture the Kennedy Center, except instead of going to see plays there, they rounded up everyone of a certain faith and they sent them there until they started to take them to concentration camps. So what's happening in this picture is that the group of people in the middle, did anyone not see these? We needed to, okay. So the group of people in the middle, these are, these are Jewish people who are being walked to the center. And these people on the sides, who are they? Nazis. No, they're you and me. These are regular people. They're going about their Sunday business. And imagine you're out on Sunday, you're like going shopping, and next to you there are groups of people being walked to the Kennedy Center, which is now a deportation center, where everyone goes and they disappear and they don't come back. And I thought that this was so interesting because this is happening like right in front of people's eyes. You know that your neighbors are disappearing. They're disappearing right in front of you. But you have to figure out, what am I gonna do about it? Because like I said, it's really dangerous to do anything about it. So I really wanted to write a book from the perspective of someone who was in, who was in that position. Nothing bad is happening to her, but bad stuff is happening all around her and she has to decide whether or not she's gonna she's going to act or not. And so my main character, Hanukkah, that's her. She's one of those people just walking along while bad stuff is happening, and she has to decide what to do. Um, so when I started to research, I also started to learn about the different kinds of resistance activities there were. And this I thought was really interesting, because this is a resistance activity that was taken up by a lot of young people, especially a lot of young women. Um, and when I say young, like, like your age, maybe. Somehow I lost. Oh, there we go. Thank you. OK, so this photo that I'm going to pass around, this is a teenage girl. She's carrying a purse. And you might notice something off about the purse, the first person who sees it. Someone said it already. Did you say it? Yeah, there's a camera. It's, there's a camera in the purse. So, so this girl was a part of the resistance called the illegal camera. And the illegal camera, yeah, it has, does everyone see it? The, you can see the lens in the bottom. So what she did, her form of resistance, she decided was going to be to document what was happening. So when the secret police um, arrested people and beat people up on the street, she was going to take photographs of it. Does that remind anyone of anything happening today? You nodded your head. What are you thinking? It reminded me of that, too. It reminded me of how we see, now when we see acts of violence, we see... Um, people taking photographs. Did I pass around the wrong photos? I'm losing my mind. Am I still sitting on the photos? Thank you. Um, and I thought that that was really meaningful, is that here's a person who, she's young. She probably doesn't have a house to hide people in, but she's decided that her form of resistance is going to be to document it, is going to be to say, later on, if you try to tell a different story, if you try to say that something else happened, I am here to tell you that this happened, and I can prove that it did, because here are photographs. And I thought that that was so powerful, that 80 years ago, people are thinking about this as, as their form of, of protest. Um, so the last photograph that I'm going to pass around. So remember I told you about the, the Kennedy Center, like deportation center. This is a picture of that. This is the back alley. This is the back alley of that. Um, here, can I start this with you? of that theater. And um, this photograph was taken, not by the girl whose picture I just showed you, but uh, by a very similar, by, by a similar young girl. This photograph was taken by a girl who lived in the apartment building behind the theater. And she looked out one day, and she knew it was a deportation center, and every day she would see new groups of people come in. 
And one day she looked out and she saw her best friend. Her best friend was Jewish and had disappeared from the school. And, and suddenly there she was in the alley behind the theater. And there was nothing the photographer could do. Her name was Lydia. There was nothing that Lydia could do except photograph her friend and say, this is the last time that I saw her. And her friend did not survive. Her friend um, was killed in a concentration camp. But I thought that this photo was really powerful. Um, and the, the girl who's, circ who's circled in the photo, if you see it, it's, she's kind of blurry. But the circled girl is who I picture when, um, when I pictured Miriam, the, the girl that everyone is trying to find in my book, which is this, this girl who was there, and, and then suddenly she wasn't. Um, so I probably talked way more than you wanted to know about occupied Amsterdam in the 1940s. But I think it's, like I said, I, I think that when we're talking about history, we're really talking about human behavior, which is, which is the same through the decades. Again and again, we see people making the same mistakes and struggling with the same issues. So um, I'd, love to, I'd love to open it up for questions, and they can be questions about the Netherlands, or about writing, or about books, or instead of asking questions, you can just tell me some things that I should be reading or learning about, or give me some ideas for my next stories. Definitely take that, too. So, yeah? I've never really studied this, so why did they dislike the Jewish people? Oh, gosh. That is such an enormous question that, um, that people write whole books about it. But, but essentially, have you heard of Adolf Hitler? OK. So after World War I, the country of Germany was in, in a really bad way economically. It, like A lot of people couldn't find jobs. A lot of people couldn't um, find work. And basically, this man, Adolf Hitler, rose to power by using the scapegoat of the Jewish people, by saying the reason that we can't, the reason that the country is struggling is it's the Jewish people's fault. They took all of your jobs. They, um, they're doing better than you financially. They, they became a, a scapegoat until the whole country in a kind of mass frenzy um, bought into it. And they were persecuted on a really widespread basis. And if anyone else has also studied the Holocaust and has like, better ways to, to describe it in a shorthand way, I'd love to please, please jump in. Yeah. Um, I have a question about writing. Um, what does it feel like to read your own book? Because whenever I read my own stuff, I always like notice all the little mistakes that I can't just enjoy it. It's the worst, isn't it? <laughs> like every time I read anything, I think this is the dumbest thing anyone has ever written. Why? Why am I? Why did I do it this way? Um, so the bad news is it never changes. The good news is that we are, I think, often our own worst critics. And also, the more times you read something, the more, th the more things you notice that you would change. But most people are only going to read what you write, you know, once or twice. So remind yourself of that. You're reading something for the dozenth time, and most people are not going to be nearly as critical. Yeah. Does anyone, is anyone else a writer who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, OK. You, how do you feel when you read your work? Every yeah. time I read it, I notice something different. I know, and by like the tenth time, you're like, haven't I noticed it all? But like, no, you've never noticed it all. There's always something you would change. Do you, what do you think? I actually agree with y'all. Yeah, mine's the same way. OK. Like, I'll just keep trying to change it to make it better. And then I'm like, I just lost that idea, and I'll start it. Yeah. Yeah, so the only good news that I have to say is that I've interviewed some really, really famous writers and they, like, like Nobel, like Pulitzer Prize winning writers, and they all feel the same way. It's not just us, it's, it's everyone. Everyone doesn't like what they write when they write it, but um, we just learn to let it go. And no other people are sometimes better judges of our work than we are. Yeah. Were you always passionate about writing? Um, 
No, not really. You know, I, I got into journalism because I have, uh, I, really, <laughs> I really get really nervous when I have to talk to people. Um, like I get really uncomfortable and, and I thought journalism would be a good way to force me to have to talk to people. Um, and if I could just do all of my reporting and stuff and never actually have to write, that would be awesome. But unfortunately, nobody pays you for that. So the writing just became like the thing that I have to do in order to get to have those other experiences. Yeah, I do, are you, do you like the writing part or the interviewing part of journalism better? What do, you, what do you like about it? Because you get to know more about the, either the situation or the person. Yeah. But then sometimes I feel like when you have had a really good interview, like when you really feel like you've learned a lot, those are the stories that I feel the most stressed out about. You know? Because you're like, I really want to do this justice. This person was really interesting. Am I, am I good enough? Like, am I good enough to write that? So, I don't know. If you have any advice, I welcome that advice. Oh, yeah. Did you enjoy writing your book? So I did and I didn't. When, when, you guys, when you guys write, I'm always curious to know about people's processes. Do you always start writing from the, from the beginning of whatever you're working on, or do you ever start other places in it? The beginning for me. I start from the beginning. I start from the plot and then work backwards and then go through. Okay. And then you like fill things in yeah. as you go. Yeah. What? Um, I usually start with a character design because usually my book idea is either, well, sometimes I'll have just an idea for something that I thought would be really cool, or I'll have an idea of a person that I thought would be really interesting. Yeah. And I'll design the character to the smallest detail as if, like, if they have glasses, how they put on their glasses, or, and then from that, I design a story around them. Yeah. So I think that I'm most, I think that I'm most like, like you, where I, I'll think of a scene, maybe I'm like a mixture of, of the two of you, where I'll have a scene that I really want to write and a character that I really want to write about. Um, and so I'll write that scene. And then I'll write, you know, other scenes as I, as I think of them. So this is a long way of saying the beginning of the writing is really, really fun because I'm writing the things that came naturally. But then later when you have to go and fill in the rest, it's like, oh, there's a reason that I saved this until last because it's really hard <laughs> because I don't, I don't know how to do it. So it's fun in the beginning and then at the end I would just give anything to have it be over with, I think. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, wait. Okay. You asked one already, so you go first. Um, uh, when you went to the political convention, like, what was your grasp of it, like, as far as, like, like your understanding of what was going on? Yeah, so someone asked this. I was in a class earlier today, and I, I've, been, I've been thinking about how to have a better answer, but the, the broadest way that I can describe it is that it just really felt like going into two completely different universes. It was, it was like visiting two different countries. And, um, and people were not, um, people seemed to be af afraid of completely different things and be talking about completely different things. Um, I read this study a few days ago that I thought was completely fascinating, which, um, which said that it, it was all about like what Democrats buy versus what Republicans buy, and and like they don't even buy the same laundry detergent, and they don't even go to the same movies. Like I was reading that Democrats are 97 percent more likely to go see horror movies, but Republicans are something like 80 percent more likely to go see romantic comedies, and and I think that that that's a really scary and weird snapshot of the country right now is in that if, if we're not even going to the same movies, like what, are, what, are, what can we talk about? What kind of common ground can we find to talk about? Um, and, and that's kind of what struck me about the political conventions is that you had, uh, 
you were talking to, to groups of people who, who really passionately believed in what they believed in, and um, they were kind of on different planets from each other. So after you finish up your schoolwork tonight, figure out a way to uh, fix the country, and then get back to me and let me know what you figured out. Did you have a question? What advice would you give to people who want to become writers? So the first advice, there's really only like one piece of advice, and that is to write, which sounds really basic. But it's amazing how many people I meet, like grown up people who are, who are like, oh, I'm a writer. But then when you ask what they're writing, they're like, well, I might write x. And I sort of believe that if you're a writer, you should, you should be writing. You should be writing all the time. And the thing is, I think a lot of people think that they can't write until they have like a really good idea, or until they know how it ends, or until they know how it's going to go. And that's just not, that's not true at all. Most of what you write on any given day is going to be really bad because most of what any of us write on any given day is really bad. Um, and I'll have days where I'll get up the next day, read what I wrote the day before, and delete three-fourths of it. And that's okay. It doesn't, your first pass doesn't have to be good. It's just what you want to do is get yourself in the habit where you're doing it every day so that when you don't do it, it feels like you forgot to brush your teeth or it feels like you forgot to wear underwear. It just has to be like, I write every day because it's part of who I am and what I do. And getting good at it, like that comes later. Sometimes that doesn't come until a lot later, but there's, there's, there are zero shortcuts. Like you just kind of have to do it. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I just want to ask, what made you decide on um, this period of time um, in your book, like World War II? Yeah, so um, I, I read The Diary of Anne Frank a lot when I was growing up. Has it, have any of you read The Diary of Anne Frank? Okay, yeah, half of you. So, um, so that book is set in Amsterdam from 1942 to 1944, but it, it all takes place in, from inside of one room. And as I got older, I realized that I had read this book probably 10 times, but most of what I knew about the city was from within one room looking out. And, and I was just really curious to know what the, what the city would have looked like to someone living, uh, living on, on the outside and someone trying to navigate the streets. Have you visited Rome? Yes, I have. Yeah. <coughs> Anyone else? Yeah. So you say right off. Okay. Oh, it's like <laughs> left, left. Okay. So you say you write all the time. Are you um, writing anything that you plan on getting published? Yeah, um, I just finished a book. Um, my next book is is for um, is for adults, and it's it's nonfiction. It's about a, it's about an arsonist. It's true crime and nothing at all like this. But um, after that, I'm going to start next month on a book, another book that's YA, and it's set in 1943, but in America. It's set. Um, in an internment camp in the United States that had Japanese and German prisoners living in it. Yeah. Did you make it? What? No. Um, it's, it's, it's this little town called Crystal City, Texas. And the whole, the whole town basically became an internment camp. Yeah. 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 Like they, I mean, America was not solely heroic during World War II. And we rounded up a lot of our own citizens. So this book is about some of the immigrant characters who ended up being uh, in this internment camp during the war. Yeah? In the Audible version, you gave an interview at the end where you hinted that there might have been a sequel to The Robin Hood Code. Is there a plan for that? I don't think I'll ever write a sequel I mean, I think I know, I know what happened to the characters, but um, I feel like they were left at a pretty complete place in the end. And uh, I mean, I think if I did do a sequel, it wouldn't be about, um, there, there are a few characters in this book who are really pretty minor, but in my mind, I know a lot more about their backstory and find them really interesting. So it would focus on the, those characters rather than the central ones. Yeah. Um, going back to the convention, um, how does it feel in journalism to like, write about some 
something like I don't know how much you get to put your own thoughts on what happens when you're reporting, um, when you're writing. But um, how does it feel to like when you're interviewing someone who you said they had completely different worlds? If you completely disagree with someone and you're talking to them about it, how does that feel? Because when I talk to someone I completely disagree with, but I can't tell them that I completely disagree with them, it seems it's like very awkward and hard to like, maintain conversation. Okay, so before I answer, I'm so, I'm so curious about that question. Does anyone else have any? Does anyone else have experience with this? And what do what do you guys, what do you guys do? You've never talked to people you disagree with? Come on. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you're right cuz like the the difference when you're when you're a journalist as opposed to when you're like talking to a friend is that you're right. I I can't be like, "Well, I think that's wrong." Um, cuz that's not my job. But but you know, I think that the interviews where I'm talking with someone who makes no sense to me are the most interesting interviews because um because I'm, tr I'm trying so hard to understand where they're coming from and, um, and why their position makes sense to them and what went into making them have this position that um, I feel like I, I feel like it's, it's not hard for me to tell me, I, I never want to tell them that they're wrong because that's not my job. My job is, is just to try to understand, like, where did this come from and, and why do you think this way and how can I explain this to readers in a way that will hopefully help us understand each other a little bit more, you know, rather than just having everyone seem like a caricature or a, or a cartoon or, um, you know, I saw a lot of like, I defriended all of the Trump supporters on Facebook, or like, I'm not going to follow anyone on Twitter who likes Hillary Clinton. And, and so I feel like my job is to, is to introduce people to each other a little bit. And to do that, you have to really take what people are saying seriously as best you can. I see like a hand, but no face attached to it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. And say, I and ask them why I think that, so that you understand how they're feeling, and maybe you might agree with them. Did it work? Like, do you, do you feel like it worked? <laughs> yeah. OK. What was, the, what was the assignment? Were you writing about a particular issue? Well, we did three different assignments. Well, four. We were like practicing for a test, so okay. we did Angie's passions. Oh, yeah. So we did one from a perspective of a boy who had his first communion. Okay. And we were trying to see, and we wrote an essay on how he felt. Okay. And, and what he learned. <laughs> and Yeah. And we learned some like lesson that it dealt with today because who that story? Uh, you know, like, he was like, you can't blame other people from your, for your faith because he was blaming um, Adam and Eve for not having food because if they weren't able for getting food, then he would have been in the garden of Eden and would have like food forever. Uh -huh. And he was homeless, so the king let him stay. But he was like, you must not open the green door. Yeah, which which totally goes back to what I was, I was kind of trying to say in in the beginning with what led to this book is that it was it's really easy to look back and say, 
Um, why did why did they act like that? Why didn't more people stand up? Why didn't more people help them? And yeah. Um, was this writing process for this book different than your other books? Um, well, my other books are science fiction, so my other books didn't need as much research, and this needed a, this needed a lot of research. So, so that was different, and that made it easier in some ways because whenever I was like, I don't know what happens next, I could go to historical sources, and they would sometimes tell me what happened. Like, oh, around this time there was also there was a big roundup, and that maybe I should incorporate that into my story, and that would be really that was really good. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Um, when I look at the title, the girl in the blue coat, I can't help but think about the movie, The Shameless List. And that one scene when the girl had the red coat, yeah. she was lost. Did you have a connection with that when you came up with the title? Um, I have such disappointing news about the title. I did not come up with it, and it was not my first choice. It was, it was just kind of like came out of a brainstorming session. So I talked to a school a few weeks ago, and they were like, we've been doing essays about the meaning of the title. And I was like, oh, there is no meaning about the title. I feel so bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, going back to writing from someone else's point of view, we also did a quick uh, timed writing where we looked at a photo from uh, during when integration first started happening. Yeah. Um, it w I think it was during the with the Little Rock Nine, and there was um, we had to write first from the perspective of the African American girl who's going to school. Yeah. And it was just three minute writing, so it was like really fast. And um, that, for most of us, it was pretty easy to interpret uh, what she was feeling because um, some of us, like, um, you could relate to her because people had been, like, uh, you could think of, like, also, like, when you're learning about history, you're thinking of, like, all of, like, how hard it was, so you've learned a lot about that. Yeah. But then we had to do right from the perspective of, the other, uh, this one girl at her school who was screaming at her in this photo. And it I was bet just that was so really hard. difficult just to think of what she was going, like what she was thinking and you're just like, why would she, like, I have no idea. And just to come up with something for what she was thinking was just so difficult, but I also think it was a really good exercise. So that was like sort of. You know, I know that the I know the photo you're talking about, and someone actually does. Every do do you guys know this photo? Does it ring a bell? It's a really it's a really powerful, hard to look at photo of this young girl trying to just go to school and being yelled at and spit on by these these angry these angry other students. Um, I did read I did read interviews with. Uh, some of the other people in that photo, they went back and found them like 50 years later and they found that screaming woman and she was appalled by her behavior and, and felt um, as terrible about it as she should have. And so we could at least take solace in, in that in that sometimes people who even make the worst mistakes you can imagine learn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have you ever, at the beginning you said how you were writing about a, a time a while ago, but you realized that you were really writing about stuff that was going on today in a way because it connected? Yeah. And I know you said you also wrote science fiction. Yeah. So I've read a lot of science fiction. And um, it's always like very futuristic and very different and whatever. But then when you think back to it, there are all this perfect society that's trying to be built. And it seems similar to what's trying to be built a long time, what was trying to be built during the Holocaust. Huh. So did you ever think about anything like, because you're typically a science fiction writer that, or you have been a science fiction writer that you sort of were trying to build this utopian society and then figured out like a different perspective on 
the Holocaust that you were. Yeah, writing. I think that that's a really I think that that's a really smart connection to make. I mean, I I was not thinking when I wrote wrote the, my science fiction novels. I was not thinking of a particular time in in world or American history, but. Um, I think that a, a pattern of science fiction is, is we see people trying to build perfect societies that fail but because their, you know, initial, their, their premise is just so completely flawed. And, and we do see that in the, in the United States, in the world. We see people saying, things will be better if only we can do this. And then whatever this is, they take it to um, you know, a, crazy, a crazy extreme. So I think that that's a really smart connection. I think we have time for one more question. So when we write essays in class, our teacher tells us to, he gives us two grades based on what we said and how we said it. So do you think what you said and how you said it plays a big role in the book and does it affect the reader's perspective of what's going on in the book? Oh, definitely. I mean, so I was just reading, have any of you guys read or heard of The Thousandth Floor? It's okay. It's um, it's a really it's a really popular book for teenagers right now, and I kept hearing people talk about it, so I decided to read it. And I was so conflicted because I was like, oh, this this plot is so interesting, but this writing, I'm just, I'm really not connecting with the writing. And I think that you know the the best books are ones where you. Uh, you like both, and where you, you honestly don't even think about how it's written because it feels natural and it doesn't feel forced. So um, I like that. I like, I like those two grades, because those are, those are equally important things that kind of have to work. Is he here? Do you want me to tell him? Okay. Before we thank Monica, I just want to make one other thank you, which is to an open book foundation that is providing books for all of you. Um, of the Girl in Blue Coat to take home with you. And we want to thank you for a wonderful program. Oh my gosh, thank you. You guys are awesome. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.